Today's podcast is brought to you by the Bioceuticals Integrative Oncology Workshop with Dr. Lee Zalchula. This full day program will run between the dates of the 20th and 28th of July across Melbourne, Sydney, Gold Coast, Adelaide and Perth. The intensive class will explore key concepts and therapeutic integrative strategies for breast, prostate, colon and lung cancers, as well as how to support toxicities associated with conventional treatment. By the end of the day, you'll be able to confidently implement this important aspect of patient care into your clinical practice. For more information and to register for this critical event, please visit the Bioceuticals website at bioceuticals.com.au. This is FX Radio, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. And with me on the line today is Dr Penny Caldercott, who, after growing up in Adelaide and Boston, having both parents being paediatricians, Dr Caldercott settled on the central coast of New South Wales to study medicine. She's now been a general practitioner for over 22 years. In 2003, she established Invitation to Health, a medical centre that integrates the best of evidence-based conventional and complementary medicine. Penny's been a board member of four non-profit organisations for over 20 years, including the Central Coast Division of General Practice and now the AIMA board, of which she is now president. And I would love to welcome Penny Caldercott to FX Radio. Welcome, Penny. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Penny, we're going to be talking about something exciting, and that's the 2015 AIMA conference. But I think first we need to go back to the start. What is AIMA, the Australian Integrative Medicine Association? Sure. Yeah, so AIMA is um, uh, the peak body representing integrative medicine doctors and practitioners in Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been established for, I think, around about 25 years now, um, and over 25 years, it's sought to to represent uh, integrative medicine doctors. And we're, we're talking about all doctors, not just GPs. Often we think of it as more GPs, but there are many uh, specialist doctors who are now um, practicing in some forms of integrative medicine. Um, right. So to represent these practitioners and other practitioners and also to to really drive the the aims of integrative medicine, uh, eventually, we hope, uh, into the mainstream. Um, and, and also to represent integrative medicine in the media and in lobbying to government. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think that's an important point because there's got to be a lot of lobbying or else, you know, nothing upsets the status quo when we can just give up on integrative medicine and just do medicine. Yeah. So I suppose that the issue at the moment is that although um, conventional medicine is extremely good at acute medicine, surgical medicine, all that kind of stuff, our model that we work with is really a chronic disease model. And um, a chronic disease model going forward is kind of not ideal without adequate uh, attention to preventative, more preventative medicine and also towards a kind of medicine that help, can help people move from chronicity of, of illness or symptoms back to, uh, back to a state of well-being. And that's where integrative medicine is uh, it really uh, works well. Mm. I, I want to delve into that a little bit later when we talk about how your the evolution of your practice. But first, sure. w- would, let's talk about the AIMA conference that's coming up. Could you tell me about the content of the conference? Because to me, I looked at the the um, the brief of it, and there's some really important topics there for almost everybody that they all need to know. Can you go through them, please, and, and you know really what the AIMA conference will bring for them? Sure. So this conference we've called Taking the Pulse of Integrative Medicine. So we really want to look at where is integrative medicine up to now, what's happening from a political perspective. So there's a a great session being run by Karen, facilitated by Karen Mm. Phelps on where we're up to politically and kind of legally and what's happening within the, within, in the industry in terms of what kind of drivers are there for integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. We want to look at how, how is the practitioner faring now? So what's happening to the practitioner? How are they working? What are the, 
the what are the things that are working well, what's not working so well, what do we need to focus on there? And also how's the patient faring um, within this system? Because a lot of integrative yes. medicine is actually being driven by the patient. So mm. we have many, many people out there using um, all kinds of forms of integrative medicine. And the thing about the, the uh, practitioner or this, this drive for integrative medicine from our perspective is how do we coordinate and train and motivate practitioners to service this kind of growing desire within our community. You, you bring up a really good point there about your patients are using all sorts of alternative or complementary therapies, and yet the naysayers for complementary medicine will lump it all into one bag, and so they lump in yoga with echinacea. And there's mm. there's there's such a, it's like lumping in pediatrics with um, you know rheumatology, which I know they can sometimes go hand to hand, but they're two mm. different specialties. Um, what's the general general consensus here on on how where we need to move with this and and the education that needs to go hand in hand with that? Look, I guess from the beginning you're looking at things like re, you know research and there, a lot of people who who are kind of naive, I guess, about integrative medicine say there's not much research out there. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that that's not true. There's a huge amount of research out there. And there's stuff being published in mainstream journals and news, medical newspapers all the time. Um, so there is a lot of research. Of course, it's a little bit different because we don't have necessarily the – um, the huge trials that have been funded both by government and predominantly by pharmaceuticals. And so that's a little bit different. But really what we need to be doing is pulling this research in and translating it into uh, into guidelines so that we we really understand what this research is telling us and help us to guide us in how we how we should be using this. Um, and, and then we, we talk about evidence-based medicine, but we forget that part of evidence-based medicine is actually experience. So mm. clinical experience yep. is evidence-based medicine. And so, so we need to really be able to pull all of this together. And actually the last, we're having a workshop at the end of the conference on the Sunday afternoon, uh, where, um, Jennifer Hunter, who's been, uh, who's a researcher and a, and an integrative general practitioner has, has set up a new tool for pulling, um, research together in integrative medicine to actually help make clinical decisions. So that's going to be really interesting to have a look at that. Um, so, so there's that and then there's how do we, how do we uh, I guess, translate what we see as integrative medicine into a language that's accessible to, uh, to many practitioners, yeah. so people who would consider themselves to be very conventional because we're talking about science. Yes, so, so sometimes there's this, this, this idea that integrative medicine is not about science. It's absolutely about science. And even more so sometimes than some of, um, some of our, you know, following conventional guidelines. Because in, as an integrative practitioner, you need to understand biochemistry at a, at a really, uh, uh, Detail, precise but... kind of level yeah, yeah. Um, to be able to practice with it. And mm. so we, we, we're talking about science both in terms of the, the, the applied um, uh, practical science as well as the, the research that's come out and, and being able to apply that to our, our clinical practice. Um, and then uh, there is, you know, there are a number of organisations uh, nationally and internationally that do educate around the area of integrative medicine. In Australia, we have Actin, you know, Nutritional Environmental Medicine and numerous other organisations. And there will be a diploma coming out on integrative medicine through the Royal Australian College of General Practice. So so things are, are really, you know, they, they are starting to shift. Yeah. Um, there are many doctors, I would say, that have an open mind mm. Um, but really don't know what to do and where to start. Yeah. So that's really important that we start to kind of bring them on board and show them that this is not actually a whole paradigm change. This is just integrating uh, more scientific principles and research uh, into our practice. Yeah. I think the interesting thing that you spoke about there was the, the, the point about you know best practice and experience. And there's an interesting paper by Smith and Pell that was published in BMJ um, 2001. And it's the avoidance of trauma um, by use of parachutes and a randomised control trial. And, oh, yes, and yes. the joke there, of course, is who goes into the placebo arm. Exactly. <laughs> the the message there is that the RC, RTC is not necessarily the be-all and end-all of good medicine for the patient. 
Yes, I would agree with that. Mm. It's so, a it's a limited way of looking at at, at um, research, and it, it's a it's a wonderful tool, but it's not the only tool. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So I want to delve back now into your history because you've got quite an interesting history. How did your current practice evolve? Well, I started practicing uh, general practice on the Central Coast. So I did my internship and residency, and the hospital wasn't my thing. So I actually got up quite early, um, and I, I I was always had this interest in in integrating with other practitioners. You know, I always had this feeling that what I'd been taught in medical school just just wasn't the whole picture. Yeah. Um, and so when I came out, I started, uh, I guess, attracting a lot of patients who weren't being believed by other people. I mean, one of the things is I love a good story, so I'm always love my listening to my patients' stories. But yeah. I started believing the people with chronic fatigue at a time when everyone else was telling them that it was just in their head and that there wasn't really any basis to their symptoms. And, I mean, symptoms, there's always a basis to symptoms and whatever's in your head is also part of your physiology and biochemistry, actually. Mm. Um, And so then once I started accumulating all these people, I thought I'd better go and find out what to do about looking after them and actually being able to provide something different. And so I started attending conferences and talking to people and learning what I could, attending the Act and Primary and stuff. And then in... uh, it was probably about early, I don't know, 2001, um, I had this, I was walking in the bush down on the south coast and had this vision for an integrative medical centre. It just kind of came quite out of the blue and surprised me. Mm. And it sounded kind of, it felt kind of interesting because it came as all as one package. And it was really about having an integrative centre that integrated at, at kind of every level. So from integrated within the local community as well as the larger community mm. as well as the academic community, but also um, a place where everyone who worked there um, was kind of on the same level. It's just we have, you know, different skill sets and where we could work as an integrative team and individually work very integratively with our patients. So, so have a relationship um, that was respectful and and where you actually work with your patient yeah. along the path to well-being as opposed to just as a prescriber and a practitioner. Oh, I'm loving it. <laughs> so do you what sort of practitioners do you have in your in your clinic? So we have uh, we have um, general practitioners, of course, mm. and some of us are, are I guess a little bit sub specialized. So we have some who, a general general practitioners. We've got people doing nutritional environmental medicine. We've got people who are specialising in some of the low grade infectious things, in autism, uh, in a whole lot of the spectrum for children, um, depression, anxiety, a lot of mental illness. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, all of these things often come from a similar basis. So um, we also have uh, nutritionists, dietitian. We have psychologists, osteopaths. Uh, we've just started with a holistic dentist. We have art therapists, um, uh, wow. Chinese medicine, kinesiology. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. How but big is yes. this place? And nurses. Um, we have, <laughs> Don't we have, you dare well, forget have, the nurses. <laughs> oh, no, our nurses. Uh, well, um, and actually, actually, some of our therapists are actually our receptionists because our receptionists are crucial yeah. to people feeling welcome, Absolutely. heard, directed in the right direction. I mean, they're just a, you know, they're a key point within our organization. And, and of course, you know, the nurses and the doctors work, work very closely together. But we've started also doing combined consults with integrative nurse, uh, doctor ah. and naturopath. Bringing in, so we all actually sit together with yep. the patient, yep. and then we bring in other practitioners as they become part of the the patient's journey. So it could be psychologist or dentist or um, osteopath or anyone else with, else within the team. That's a that's a huge evolution. But w- w- like, how did it start? Like, you must have started on you know just just Penny sitting in a room. Uh, no, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny, actually, because when this vision came, it was kind of like big, and then and then I thought about making it a bit smaller, like just having a few rooms, but it kept it kept needing to be a bigger thing. So we yeah. ended up with this place with the like eight consulting rooms. And at first, it was just me, and I'd come from another practice where, but it was about half an hour, forty minutes away. Mm. So actually, what we started was all sitting in our little because we have this kind of quiet meditation prayer room within our center, yeah. and we all just sat there and and uh, waited. For the phone to ring. <laughs> and the phone would ring and we'd be like, oh, great, you know, there's someone coming in. But, like, it was very quick. Yeah. Um, I, I had quite a reasonable following, but um, also 
uh, the place just seemed to to just naturally attract practitioners. So mm. we never got practitioners through ads. They pretty much kind of heard us somewhere and came knocking on the door. Um, so, but it was a you know it, it took us it's taken us thirteen years to get to where we are. And yeah. I, I suppose in, I, what I'd have to say, and, and it's important for Ama too, is that the integrative model is um, is quite a, a complex model. It takes quite a long time to help patient, uh, practitioners to to really work together, as in like on the same page. Mm. And I think that for AMA, what, what's really important is that, yes, you can be an integrated practitioner in and of yourself, but if we're talking about doctors, you know, that's great to pick up other skills and stuff, but really the richness for your patients comes when you work in a team with other practitioners. Yeah. And that's the model that I think is really important going forward, yeah. that integration is not just about the one practitioner. It's really about the team you that you, you know, choose to work with. And indeed for the patient's benefit. This is the whole thing that I think, you know, we need to remember in the oh, end it's for the patient. <laughs> well, and it doesn't matter who you refer to or work with, your patients think you're great for <laughs> referring them. So, so, I mean, it's a win for everyone. And, yeah. and the patients, I mean, I can't tell you how much, they, how relieved they are after often very long journeys of being quite unwell to sit in a room with three practitioners who are entirely devoted to listening to and helping them along their journey. It's yeah. just a wonderful, yeah. a wonderful thing. And our results are, you know, are looking very good, you know, for the moment. So and, and you know, that to me speaks volumes in that the frustrations of... Uh, th- that are embedded in in the the workings of the current medical system, and and uh, you know I, I, I guess I'm including the practice of doctors here. There's so many doctors out there that are, that are frustrated with the treadmill, and there are so many yes. patients that are equally frustrated because they're just not getting heard, and they can't yes. because of the treadmill. <laughs> and the treadmill isn't right. the de- isn't by d- the um, isn't devised by the doctor. It's devised by the government. Your health basically revolves around how much you cost. Yes, and, and, you know, they've frozen our rebates for 2018, which is a really outrageous thing to do, and mm. then have suggested have suggested to us that we'll make up for the kind of the shortfall for our patients who can't afford it, which basically means the doctors will be carrying yeah. their patients, yeah, the if patients. that's what they do. But, yeah, so that's another story. But I guess the integrative model also actually means that you need to spend time. Mm. You actually need to spend time. And sometimes, you know, it's at the end of your 30-minute consultation that your patient comes out with what they really need. And so, you know, there has to be patience and time spent. Um, and, and spending more time with people often means that you see them less often. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that really makes a huge difference. But with this integrated model, I mean, they come in for an hour and a half on the first consult. Yeah. And, um, and so there's really an opportunity to, to look at where they're up to. But I, I think that many integrated practitioners work like, you know, do work like this. Yeah. Have you got a, a something that you're passionate about, your, your niche? Okay. I guess I would say my passion is kind of a bit broad. So in terms of my practice, um, it's really about helping people to uh, be free to, to continue their journey differently. So that's, that's about, I guess we're talking about quite a holistic model when you, where you're looking at what are the things that are physically and biochemically holding people back and what are the things that may be more um, emotional and spiritual that are holding people back. And I think that from in a, in a really big picture, um, our world is going to be a different place when people are able to really um, understand and live their, their passions uh, within their personal life and within their work life. And so I see my role as an integrative doctor as helping to facilitate that process. And I think one of the great things about um, about being a doctor or being a therapist is that because we're not we're not in a personal relationship with these people in terms of um, you know they're not part of our everyday life. Um, we've we're in in a place where we can actually really love all of those bits of those people that, that normally nobody else can love. Yeah. And I think that when when you're in, in that state with someone in a state of really non-judgment and being able to just love them for who they are, then many things start to, to change and evolve. Um, we're, we're no good at changing when we're being judged, mm, but we're, we actually have this great capacity for change when we're being respected and loved and not judged. And so that's what I love about my work. And I guess in a bigger picture with integrative medicine, I'd just love to see um, medicine start to evolve more so that we're, we're really able to 
um, address the things that are holding um, that are holding our patients back. And so sometimes it's more on an emotional level, and we might more work with counsellors and psychologists and with our own listening and, and guidance. And and other times um, it's the biochemical things that are holding people back, like yeah. they're not good at producing serotonin or dopamine, and how do we help them to do that? Um, or there may be lots of other physical problems. And so I'd love to see that that our medicine morph into a more whole person medicine. Um, that helps to address these kind of things to help bring people back into a state of well-being, not just not be sick or or or, or be in a state of kind of chronic illness that's being managed. Penny, the sort the skeptics out there will sort of say, well, that's all nice and airy fairy, but but we're talking about clinical management of your patients. But but what I've seen with people like, especially those with chronic disease, like for instance fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, that when they feel listened to, that stressor is taken off them. How do you find that or how do you ratify that with the the measurements that you have to do of practising measurement, of practising medicine, forgive me? Sure. And so I guess maybe they're not the best example of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue because it's not a lot to measure, except when we're looking at very specific, more integrative medicine testing around, you know, proper liver function testing and, yeah. and uh, bowel stuff. But, but in terms of, I guess when you're looking at chronic illness in general practice, um, in conventional general practice, you're really looking at diabetes and hypertension, hyperlipidemia and all kinds of yeah. uh, cardiac okay. disease and stuff like that. And so those measurements, look, I think that those measurements should be used only as, as a way of kind of guiding you to, pro- to, to progress. But it's really important to incorporate that into how the patient's feeling. Mm. You know, how they're feeling, how they're faring, uh, what cha- how to facilitate the changes um, that they need. And we know that the, ma- the majority of chronic illness is kind of fed by lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so if we're not able to spend enough time to help these people to to understand why and facilitate and motivate them to change lifestyle, then, then you know, we're, we're really just a bit like banging our head against a wall or, or just feeding them pharmaceuticals and, and, man- and, and looking at their blood tests and thinking that we're actually making progress because the blood tests have changed. Mm, mm. And, and I think that if you don't look at the whole person and how, and how they're faring, well, you know, their, their functionality can still be quite impaired even with reasonable blood tests. Penny, Lise Alshler will be speaking about uh, the role of integrative medicine in supporting no- standard oncological treatment with patients um, who have cancer. Take us through the role of integrative medicine for GPs in, in caring for cancer patients. Okay. So um, I guess the, if, if, when, you, when you have a patient that's either come to you with cancer or you help to make a diagnosis of cancer, um, the, the first thing that an integrative uh, practitioner would be doing is looking at what what are perhaps some of the, the, the etiological factors of this cancer. Now, we, we can't know all of them and we may miss some of them, but we certainly know that inflammation is a big uh, etiological factor in cancer. We know that some viruses can be, we're starting to understand yeah. that. We know that the immune system is a huge thing. So, so basically, um, your body should be recognizing these cells and actually getting rid of them, uh, before they do anything or before they start accumulating into a, a solid cancer. Mm-hmm. And, um, so the immune system is really important. And, and then we know that 70% of the immune system is modulated through the intestinal mucosa. And so that we know the digestive system has a huge role to play in what's happening to the immune system. You ask the majority of patients who come to see you what's happening with the digestive system and, and, and many Many, many people are having digestive problems yeah. that they think are pretty, pretty much normal because they've always had them. And so we, we look at that. We look at what's, what, is their, um, what is their emotional kind of sp- spiritual context? You know, what kind of traumas have they had? Because we know that, that, that your emotional state can also affect your immune system as well as your digestive function. So what we're doing is we're, we're looking at the whole person, their environment. We want to look at their chemical environment. What kind of chemicals are they exposed to? There's about over 140,000 chemicals now that we're regularly exposed to um, that our bodies are supposed to be able to detoxify and, and sort out. Um, so we're looking at the whole bigger environment as well as the inner um, uh, psycho-spiritual environment as well as the biochemical environment. 
to to and, and also how are the systems working together as a whole, and and then to identify what what are some of the factors that may have contributed to it. We're also really important to work very closely with. Uh, uh, um, our colleagues, particularly the conventional specialists that they're see- seeing, to help them kind of find their way through uh, what what are the options to help them to understand uh, what what they're being offered, um, and to encourage them to uh, to to follow uh, a lot of the conventional advice. I think is quite important. Mm. Um, the role of the integrative practitioner would be to support that process. Now, there may be patients who don't want to go through that process. That's a really personal decision. Yeah. And I think our role is to support them, whatever whatever the decision is, as long as we're very sure that they understand the consequences of whichever path they, they're taking and, and also to make sure that they've had all the advice that they need. Um, and so, so that so that um, support will be different for each patient. We might be supporting them through the types of therapy they're having in terms of using um, uh, nutrients, using herbs, using other things that support their, their, their process or minimise their side effects. We'll be helping them with diet. We'll be helping them to clean up their environment, um, particularly at home. Um, we'll be helping them to uh, along their emotional journey, either a journey either us or or other practitioners that mm. we work with. I mean, there you know, there's a myriad of ways in which we can help someone who who has a diagnosis of cancer and help them to kind of navigate their way through uh, all the decisions that they have to make and and the and the the kind of inner processes that will be happening along the way. What's been your experience though of dealing with um, specialists who have a conventional outlook to medicine, um, and you're dialoguing with them for the, for the benefit of the patient? Um, I guess there's a there's lots of different types of people out there in in the in the specialist field in terms of oncology. Um, some people um, and they're, they're, we've got two oncologists who'll be at our conference mm-hmm. who practice practice a bit more integratively. So some of them are very happy to have the dialogue. Um, some of them are very dismissive of anything else, and and pretty much advise their patients uh, that they shouldn't be using anything else at all. Um, there's a lot of, um, I guess, naivety. I, you could use the word ignorance, but I prefer the word naivety about what else, what what else you can do in conjunction with, say, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Yep. So there's a lot of um, things that we do that um, some practitioners would be saying are, are dangerous and put your your kind of prognosis or you know or your treatment at risk, at risk um, yeah. which are actually not only safe but facilitate the chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Yeah. And so sometimes um, you know we 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 I guess. Um, ideally, we try and have those conversations or try and include things in our letters. Um, I always ask the patient to inform uh, themselves, the, the, the specialist, what they're doing. Yep. Um, and some patients choose not to do that. I would never encourage that. I think it's really important mm. that they know. Yep. Um, and and I guess it's also um, the, the integrated practitioner has to kind of understand that there, you know, that there are little windows around um, particularly chemotherapy treatments that we need to respect in terms of not prescribing, uh, of, of having our not patients not taking anything in those kind of windows just before, during, and after a chemotherapy session. So there's a lot of, I think there's, we need to inform ourselves better. We need to inform our specialist colleagues um, a little bit better about what the evidence is. So I think we've got yes. a, really got a lot to do, but. The, but the doors are kind of gently opening, gently opening. Um, and yeah. we do have these centres around Australia now that are that are aiming anyway to provide more kind of integrative care around cancer, um, and and so I think the doors are kind of you know they're just a, a crack open, and yes. I think that that will progress. And I think I think hopefully at least the um, the newer centres that will be opening soon, dare I say that word. Um, is where we'll be looking at garnering some of this evidence by doing further research into the the adjunctive use of complementary medicines during, before, or after um, standard yeah, oncology treatment. Exactly, and actually, in Lee's uh, uh, Schiller's book, um, the definitive guide to cancer. Yep. I think it's called that's it. the, that's yeah. One. So, so she's got some fantastic um, uh, uh, charts in there about what 
kind of um, herbs and supplements you can use with what kind of chemotherapy, with what kind of cancer, yeah. what level of evidence there are for all of those. I mean, it's just brilliant. It's a brilliant book. Um, and there, brilliant book. Yeah, and there are many, there are quite a lot of other resources around um, herbs and natural supplements by Leslie Bourne and Mark Cohen. It's really good as well. Yes. Um, it, it's pretty much like a mins of, yes. the, <laughs> of herbs and supplements, which is, which is great, yeah. and they're enlarging it each time they put out a new edition with, with, with new things. Um, and, and that's got interactions, contraindications, side effects, all that, and doses. And, yep. and so there are, and there are many other resources around. It's, I guess it's helping practitioners to know where the resources are so that they can utilise them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and uh, Keith Block also did uh, wrote some papers on, um, you know, the, this sort of paranoia and lumping together of, quote, unquote, the word antioxidants, whatever that means. Um it, during chemotherapy, that it doesn't actually, on the whole of the evidence, um, um, adversely affect the effects of the chemotherapy in in uh, you know um, killing the cancer, if you like. Um, so there's some good papers that are coming out. Sure, and I mean, I guess the thing is that you know these these chemotherapeutic art, um, uh, drugs are, are made to target specific cells, and and specific cells are doing things that your other cells aren't doing That's as much. The key. And and so really, you know, the the antioxidants are there, you know, can can often kind of mop up the collateral damage that happens to the normal cells around those those areas and in the body as a whole. But mm. but you know, there there is some there is some good evidence out there, and it, it's not that hard to find. No, that's right. Um, yeah. Yep. I I think the the term needs to be torn apart that word antioxidants because it's kind of like saying pain relieving drugs. Well, you've got analgesics, you've got non-opiates, opiates, you've got antidepressants. <laughs> so what's a pain-relieving drug? You know, so, um, yeah. Penny, yep. Penny, can I ask you just to wrap up? What's your message? The AIMA conference is coming up in July. And I yep. really, you know, I'll put a call out there for every GP that even if you're mildly sceptical that you should be attending to find out the evidence that's there, what's your call as the president of AIMA? Yeah, so I would be calling... Um, I said before, GPs and specialists. So we get quite a lot of specialists to our conferences now, and we've got quite a lot of specialists who are members of AMA, which is wonderful. So I would be calling on all doctors, medical students, because it's really great that we get to the, the young doctors and help them to see what else is out there, mm. um, and and um, naturopaths and all the other um, uh, allied health and complementary therapists to come along, because I think this journey forwards. Um, in, in really moving integrative medicine into the place where it can be is, is a journey that we really have to be doing together yes. integratively, collaboratively. Um, and, and the more of us that are working together, so uh, as, as individuals, as organisations, as industry, um, as researchers, um, the more that we're able to partner together, the greater the voice is going to be out in the media, in the public and for our politicians to see that there is a, a different way forward that is much more preventative and perhaps um, has a, a, a bigger focus on healing and well-being than, than the system that we're in at the moment, uh, which is not a, I'm not saying that the system is a failed system. I'm saying that there are some limitations to the system. Mm. Um, it's really, you know, we're, we're very lucky to have a pretty amazing medical system in Australia that many countries in the world don't have. Mm. But I think that we can we can really enrich this system by bringing in this this integrative approach and the evidence that we already have, as well as gathering new evidence. Um, and so my call is that we, I, I love that we all really work together and that the only way forward now is really collaboration. Yeah. So the more of us, the better. And we hope in AIMA to be, well, we will in AIMA, uh, uh, aim to set up um, a strategy that we're already working on and a structure that helps people to engage in the work of, of integrative medicine um, through AIMA in Australia and New Zealand and with connections to uh, to Asia and, and internationally is, is what we're aiming for. Dr. Penny Caldicott, thank you so much for taking us through the, you know, where the where the lay of the land is with what patients are requiring and and indeed demanding, and what AIMA is doing for those practitioners who care for those patients. Because I think the pragmatics of it are that um, you know most of your patients are going to be at least at some time using complementary medicines, and if you are naive of them then you have no knowledge of how to use them safely or how that patient must use them safely whereas if you learn through the use um, forgive me through the attendance at conferences like AMA 
then that is going to only enhance your patient care. Yes, that's true. And it's been wonderful to talk to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thanks, Penny. This is FX Radio, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Thank you.